But yeah, uh, I'm Brian Blanche, and um, I guess uh, are the people who are here, are you here because of interest in entrepreneurship or tech or any musicians? All of the above. Oh, all of the above. So uh, have you heard of my company, Frantone, or what I do? Or Because we could just go to my YouTube channel and just skip this whole thing. <laughs> oh, hey. Peach fuzz, excellent. Okay, well, got a, I got one of my children in the house. All right, so this is where it begins. A long time ago, retail hell. Now, I was stuck in retail for the majority of my 20s. I, I had a string of dead-end retail management jobs. I, um, I did just about everything I sold. Video cassettes and shoes. This is, this is me. This is this is uh, 1989. I'm 22. Assistant manager at Payless Shoe Source. And uh, yeah, so but this is what I did for a living. It was um, retail management, and I just kind of went from one to one job to the next to the next just to pay the bills. But the retail schedules were, you know, sort of weird. So some nights you'd be working late, some nights you work the mornings, and you have odd weekdays off and you have to work every weekend. So in my spare time I just um, I started uh, a little company. And I, I had uh, you know, moved to Lancaster out in central PA and uh, my roommate was a filmmaker and I was a photographer so we sort of wanted to make some extra money so I built a little studio in our little two bedroom apartment just crammed it full of stuff. Um, I built a dark room and uh, we got a video camera with some money we pulled together from our families and like a year later we were able to get a Panasonic SVHS, uh, you know, analog <laughs> linear editing system and um, we just started trying to get jobs doing, doing work. I uh, was also recording, I, I, one of the first things I bought when I got out on my own is I, I saved up to buy a used Tascam 4-track and I started recording four tracks, uh, just with the guitar and the little keyboard that I had. And for the drums, I just, you know, it was this cheap keyboard it had like drum effects, like on the bottom keys. And I would just bang on my bang on the keys with my fingers to play the drums and do these recordings. And I, I learned how to do overdubbing on top of that. So I do like a four track, and then I take the four track, I dump it on a VHS hi-fi track as a two track, and then I dump it back to the recorder and put two more tracks on it. So now I had a six track. So. And I was also doing art, like um, I had a dark room, so I was doing a lot of photo collage and stuff. And so I was doing my own cassettes, uh, you know, like this one. And like, you know, these days, something like this would seem like, you know, wow, so what? But, you know, in 1990, to do a full color, you know, uh, thing like this is quite a, quite a challenge, um, especially on no budget and in your apartment. So, uh, yeah. This was actually quite advanced. <laughs> uh, and I had a little, yeah, so, and I, I, I was also, to do these projects, I was building a lot of things. I, um, for doing video work, um, I built my own Steadicam system. This is like 1990, 91, uh, using counterbalances and stuff so I could steady this uh, video camera so we could do these kind of floating shots. And so we actually got um, a fair amount of work doing um, promos for models and, you know, I did videos for local bands and, um, you know, uh, and other things like this. This is a this is a cartoon that I did uh, with my partner. Uh, coming up now. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, don't don't. Come on. Oh, here we go. Okay, that's not it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is a cartoon. It's only 12 seconds long, 15 seconds long. This was all done um, on paper and pen, shot on 16 millimeter. It was for an ending for a short film. Uh, it's an ending sequence. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there we go. And that, that took uh, over three months to do in my spare time. So when I wasn't actually working uh, the retail, retail job, uh, like every waking hour I was drawing cells. And to do this I had to build um, uh, you know, a, a light box 
with um, cell registration, I had to figure out how to register cells and stuff with these um, pins. And actually, I, I put it in one of my blogs that I had for circuit boards. I actually showed this light box that I made for this cartoon, which I still use because I ended up using it for doing printed circuit boards and proofing my artwork. So you know, but I so I invented all these tools, and um, and we were making money also doing um, video transfers because back around 1990, people still had lots of like films. Oh, okay. So this is a, another thing. This is um, some illuminated titles I did. I was also, because I had a dark room, I was doing codalists, which are these like large scale photographic negatives, and which allowed me to do like these, um, like this animated uh, illuminated title work uh, for uh, another project. This is actually quite hard. <laughs> like today, CGI, this would be like a no brainer, but to do this analog optical uh, was a challenge. Uh, and um, yeah, and so this is like, this is the ending title, so that same project, and this side, it's like a three-dimensional um, thing where I had like several layers, it's all done optically um, with different uh, layers of artwork, um, photographed on video, uh, and then stuff like this, this is, this is video, this is actually uh, video art, oh, and this is a prop, I was doing props too, like, you know, Mythbusters, this is a, a prop neon sign I did for another project where, um, you know, it, the guy's hat is a, gets electrocuted, but I, I made that. Um, and uh, so, uh, in addition to doing like these little um, uh, projects on our own, um, we're also trying to make money doing uh, transfers. So we're you know tra transferring home movies. People had 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter films and stuff, and so we had this kind of wild um, setup. Um, where we could um, synchronize a video camera with film camera and get the get the frame rates synchronized so that you could actually do um, transfers. And I I was doing a lot of photography, um, so I was doing my own processing, doing my own prints, uh, which uh, kind of went on with the whole thing, and uh, doing slide transfers, stuff like that. So this is how I was making my money and also earning skill, learning skills. And uh, and this is like another thing, I was doing these little videos when I was working at this, um, managing this uh, video store for a chain that no longer exists. Um, and, um, let's see, somewhere I come up here, uh, yeah, somewhere. oh, there you go, there you go. Proof, I'm behind the counter. <laughs> That's actual retail hell right there. Um, and I had, a, I had a couple bands in the 90s, so um, I was uh, playing out. This is my band, Yoohoo. There's no audio, but you know, it's, it's very, very loud and awesome, as you can imagine. There's actually a copy of this video on my YouTube channel, if you want to watch it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what we were doing. Through, uh, through retail hell, that's, um, that's how I was getting by. And um, I got out of retail hell briefly to get into broadcasting. This is, um, wow. Those red glasses have haunted me. I have all these photos of me with these big red glasses. I mean, this is uh, like 92, summer 92, 93. Um, I decided to get out of retail hell and um, took a really big risk and went into broadcasting. And so uh, I worked at an AM station part-time for the better part of a year, and then I got a full-time job working at an FM station out in, out in New York. Um, it's a 50,000 watt FM station, and I, and I ended up doing the um, the drive time, I was doing, I was doing the 7 to midnight uh, post-drive time show on the FM. And um, it was, you know, a, a learning experience. Uh, but uh, the problem with broadcasting is the pay is really, really low. It's almost like just a stipend. And uh, you get fired all the time. So it's like the, the job security isn't there. I mean, your, your job's always at risk of getting fired. But I really need to make money. Um, so I switch gears again and we had the beginnings of what would become Frantone. Now this is a, uh, well, this is an old GIF. Some of these are actually from the original Frantone website from like 95, so um, they're very gif -y. Uh This is Mert. He, um, I ended up working for him. He had this business um, out in Lancaster, a uh, rental business. And it was one of these places where you could rent uh, party tables and chainsaws and backhoes and um, tampers and popcorn machines and like anything you can imagine was there. So I, I learned all kinds of stuff. I learned how to repair motors and uh, sharpen chisels and, uh, and I learned how to move hundreds of tables. It was, you know, a learning experience. And, uh, and Mert, um, he was a very interesting guy. He, he had just bought this business. He was an executive, really. Uh, he had spent 30 years or more 
uh, as the VP of Manufacturing for Digital Computer Corporation. And so uh, he had tons of stories about the golden age of uh, digital and, you know, like the invention of the original hard drives and, um, and um, the, when they invented uh, instant replay for the NFL, which was the first fully digital, um, full video NTSC um, video recording system. It recorded like two minutes of solid video and that you could play back instantly for, you know, that's what they use for instant replay. It's all digital. And it, and it took up, uh, from what I, he told me, like a, a tractor trailer full of hard drives that would store like two minutes of video or something like that. It's crazy. So we had lots of stories. And he also, um, as you see from this uh, very giffy picture, he uh, was also belonged to a flying club, so he had access to this plane. And so we would work long days, like 10-hour days in the shop, and then we would be exhausted. We'd drive out to Lancaster Airport, and we'd get in the plane. We'd fly around for like two hours. So um, like you know, a couple of years, I locked enough flying time to get a pilot's license. I looked into touch and goes. I learned how to do navigation, uh, flew by instruments. It was great. I, I have to say, other than riding my motorcycle, the flying is uh, its the greatest experience you can have as a human being. Just just nothing like it. But so, um, so one day, um, Mert, you know, is saying, well, you know, I really miss manufacturing, so I would love to get like a little company building a little widget. I don't know what it is, just a widget, uh, just anything. And I, um, I said, well, just coincidentally, I had to tinker together a little overdrive pedal because I was in the band and I needed to get overdrive on my vibroverb amp, which was just too clean, sounded too nice, and I just needed some overdrive. So I tinkered, so I, I wanted to get uh, an Electronomics Big Muff, that's what I really wanted, but um, back in like 93, they were selling the, the gray Russian Big Muffs, they were still like 50, 60 bucks, and uh, you know, in 1993 that was you know, a lot of money, um, it was like a thousand dollars in today's money, uh, but it was a lot, and so um, I just uh, decided I would do it myself, so I, I had been doing electronics uh, as part of like the Scanline thing, I, I was also have been teaching myself how to restore antique radios. So, because um, out in the central PA, there were lots of little places that had like antiques and stuff, and there were tons of these like 30s and 40s area era um, pre-war radios that were like all over the place, all broken, none of them worked. So I was just gobbling them up for you know five bucks here, ten bucks there, and then I just res I restore the cases, I you know restore the, uh, the electronics, I'd recap them and resell them uh, on the Sunday uh, at the uh, flea market. So I had this thing going on, and I was learning electronics, and um, but I'd, I'd, I was also working with solid state, so I went to, rather than buying the Big Muff, I went out to the Radio Shack and I bought like four dollars worth of parts, and I built this little overdrive pedal. I brought it into Mert, and I said, this is what I built. I said, you know, I, I, I don't know, but you know, we could build something like this. Maybe some, maybe people will buy this. And Mert didn't know anything about music. He was just like, you know. So he, he kind of thought about it and uh, was like, well, you know, it might work. And I kind of pointed, I, I guess I got a guitar magazine or something and said, you know, guitar players use these things. But at the time, in 1993, 94, there, there were just like a handful of companies that were just making pedals. I mean, a pedal back in those days, it was an accessory. So like, you know, Ibanez, Fender, Gibson, you know, guitar makers, amp makers, they also made pedals. And they were just sort of things that you could upsell to a customer you know, if they bought a guitar or an app. But there were really only a handful of people that were actually just making pedals alone. So it was just a completely new idea. And, um, but Mert bid on the idea, and um, we spent the next year uh, trying to build a prototype for a product. Um, and this is where it, it, it just kind of, where I, I really ended up learning, well, oh, come on, you got it. <laughs> But uh, it took about a year before we ended up with this Hepcat first one. Um, I spent a year just dumping money. I, I had we had all these ideas that we we're going to do like our own cases and our own cat. So I, I I made all these casting models and um, you know I had to do the circuit boards by hand because you know we didn't have cat or anything like that. So I had to draw the circuit boards on paper at four times size on vellum and had to do like. Um, multiple separations for like the drill registers and the copper and everything and I had to take it over to this place uh, that did circuit boards and like hand them on my paper sheets and have them transfer it into AutoCAD and everything so I could do it. It was a big thing, but a big learning process. But we dumped a lot of money, a lot of time to make this, like a year. And um, when we came out with HEPCAT, I also was about, within like a few months, the internet came to Lancaster. And so, um, 
we got hooked up with the very first server. I think it was Netrax or some maybe it was something before Netrax, but but they, they had the first server in Lancaster and we got a 56k baud um, modem hookup to the server and we we were like one of a handful of people like online, and so you know Frantone.com was one of the first you know music websites and at that time very few businesses were using the internet so. To make a product like this, you couldn't just search the runner search engines. We were still using Telnet applications like Gopher and Finger to like, you know, like you would, uh, if you wanted to find a, like, a, like a list of uh, people who do castings that were on the internet, you'd, you'd, you'd set up a, a Gopher file and you put, on the, you put it out there on the web and like a week later, it would come back and you'd get a register with, a, you, know, with you know, URLs and you know, it's like, that's how you did it. It's like, almost like snail mail on the internet. But we came up with the Hepcat. And then, um, this is me. I, I, by this time, like a year in, I had gotten a house and I had set up a shop in my basement and I was tinkering together the uh, pedals there. Uh, yeah, this is a, from the original website, going around the world, World Wide Web uh, with the Hepcat. And I got, a, I got a, some press. Uh, we, uh, we had got a write-up in Guitar Player Magazine and this is 1996, it's like a, a year after we had released it. I got a write-up in the uh, in New York paper. Just very small press, um, still playing guitar, of course. And um, uh, so around 97, 96, 97, Mert sold the rental business and he ended up um, taking a, a president of manufacturing at a new startup called VR Surfer. And he, he actually went to, do, to uh, build the first virtual reality goggles for PC ever made. It was in 1996. Three, so we're talking Windows 3.1. With, you know, for 3D, it's pretty, it's pretty cutting edge. So he, he went and did that, and uh, I took Frantone full time with uh, an agreement that as soon as I would be able, I would pay him back all the debt that we'd acquired <laughs> from, from, um, from building the Hepcat. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize it would take 10 years to, get the, to accumulate that money. That's how, much, that's how much debt we had accumulated just from starting the, uh, the first product. So. Um, uh, but again, even with uh, the Peach Fuzz, uh, it just wasn't, um, I just wasn't making enough. You know, I had a mortgage now, and uh, so I took another job, um, a, a low-level engineering job this time, because I'd, I'd, in doing the, uh, the Hepcat and the Peach Fuzz, I had learned a lot about electronics and manufacturing, um, and so I had some shops, and so I went and got a, an industrial job working, uh, building and maintaining test equipment for, the, this, uh, for automation systems. This company did these uh, motorized automation systems that do like mail sorting and stuff. And basically, I build equipment to test the equipment that they made. And so, but it, it was just uh, I didn't enjoy it. I hated the drudgery of it, and so I took a leap. I sold my house and took, at the time, the biggest risk that I had ever taken, which was that I just dropped everything that I had built and decided I'd move to New York because I. During uh, 1998, 97-98, uh, I had done a lot of trips to New York looking for dealers for Frantown. And pretty much like on my first trip to New York, like the, the first hour of the first day of my first trip to New York, I was doing transfers on the subway. It was like, I took to it like that. I just knew I, it, it's where I belonged and that I could probably make it work there. So I, I just took up everything, went up to New York and um, lived in the world's smallest apartment. 80 square feet. It is possible. I, I lived in an 80, 80 square foot apartment. It cost me um, $1,000 a month. Welcome to New York. But um, I went in, th this is uh, down at Astor Place out in front of the Electroharmonics office. I, I went down to Electroharmonics. They were in Manhattan back then, uh, right at Astor Place, just at St. Mark's, uh, right next to the village, the original Village Voice um, building. And I just went in there with my pedals. I said, uh, I make these pedals. And they were like, yeah, we know. And I said, well, I need a job. And they're like, OK, we'll hire you. And they, they put me in charge of their production line. And uh, <laughs> there I, that, that's my work area. That's Ross. He was my uh, co-worker. And uh, this, is, this is where I spent two years um, doing all the electroharmonics reissues. Um, there I am. I'm about a do not solder in shorts. Okay, <laughs> life lesson. Very, very bad idea. Um, never do it. Never try it. Uh, this is one of the things I built. This is the tube tester. Um, J.C. Morrison and Mike Abram. We um, built this over the course of like six months. 
Um, there's a blog I have about the building of this if you want to look at it. It's, a, it's pretty cool. This is another machine I built. This is the first thing I, I first big machine I built. This is the first uh, tube burning machine uh, to build burn trays of tubes, 40 tubes a tray. Uh, and it was all automated. I, I built it to, to, to run through the night and cycle tubes through power up and power down standby stages. And these are the trays. It's all hand built. So I, I learned, you know, uh, how to do precision metal work to, to build these machines because every tray had to fit in every bay and it was all handmade. And there were 144 pins on every tray and all had to line up. So uh, all that kind of precision, I, again, I gained skills. Here we are. This is JC and I. Uh, testing the um, burner on the first day we turned it on. And then um, the 2000 Big Muff. Uh, I got the uh, contract. I, I'd, I'd made several designs. I actually have like a pile of designs that I did um, uh, for pr perspective things for EH. And they didn't, they decided not to manufacture those. But Mike came to me and said, you know, uh, I want to come out with an American Big Muff and I want you to build it. So I made, you know, over a dozen versions of the new Big Muff, and some were just too radical, some were too different, and there were certain, had to stay within certain design constraints, but uh, the final design was this one, and it uh, became the most lauded pedal, the most lauded version of the Big Muff, um, as far as I know. And so this is, this is my Bell Labs look. Um, at the, uh, definitely, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so New York. This uh, Sasquatch-like picture, like that, that blurry image there, that is Joey Ramon leaving Basalka. I, I, I walked into Basalka for lunch one day and he was just sitting right there having lunch. Just, and, uh, and I had like one of the first digital cameras, like a Nikon Coolpix 990. Uh, that I just, and I just, waiting for it to boot up and everything, I got this shot on his way out. I also ran into Marky Ramon. Actually, Marky Ramon ran into me like on purpose on St. Mark's, like in total punk style. Just walked right into me, tried to knock me over, and just kind of just kept on walking. I, I think he liked me. Uh, my friend Les, uh, Les Paul, um, you might have heard of him. He uh, he invented the solid body electric guitar, multi track recorder, you know, overdubbing, and pretty much less single-handedly invented the technology of rock and roll. So but, um, I knew Les pretty well. Um, my first apartment, I was about eight blocks from the original Iridium Club where he played every week. So I was down there all the time and I spent so many nights just hanging out with Les till like four or five in the morning just talking. And so, um, you know, I gave him a few of my pedals and we talked shop, we talked about electronics and music and it was just... Um, it, it was a, just one of those uh, life-changing experiences. All his stories and stories of resilience and um, you know, just um, coming back from the brink of disaster. Like he told me, like every 10 years, something happens, just almost takes me out, almost takes me out. And then I have to come back. Uh, so I, I learned about resilience from, from Wes. I learned a lot. And I also had the, uh, the, the razor sharp bangs. You know. okay. okay, so. Um, it was the summer of 2000, I got, I, work came down that EH was going to move. They were going to move out of that beautiful spot in Astor Place, and they were going to move out to Long Island City, which back in 2000 was just the middle of freaking nowhere um, out in you know, North Brooklyn, Queens. So there's no way I was going to go out there. I couldn't commute there. They didn't have subways. I just decided I would leave. Um, and the interest in Frantone had come up because I'd, I'd given Mike all of my uh, back inventory of Frantone pedals and he liquidated them like in a few days. So all these dealers were like, oh, we want more Frantone pedals. So I started Frantone in Brooklyn. I up, got a really rough space in an old foundry. It's as rough as you can get. And I did a build in. Um, spent months uh, building in, you know, uh, rooms for paint booth and uh, sound room and voila. Brand new, first Brooklyn Frantone manufacturing space in a really dirty, filthy, drafty foundry. And so here we are, you know, um, workstations uh, kind of looks a lot like the EH workstation, only this is in Frantone. And I had a Zaxxon machine. Yeah. I still have the machine. It needs, needs a new monitor, but I still have the machine. Um, and uh, so I, I, I wanted to do things differently because I, I, I from the first time I did Frantone and when um, and at EH running their production line, I really learned what worked and what didn't, and where the 
where the problems were with production. So I decided I was going to cut out all of the way to ground to have boards made stuff. I was going to make my own boards. So I developed um, this, the equipment to, to etch my own boards from copper stock. And then I developed this, um, this die system where I had these aluminum dies that were all, I made them all by hand where I could you know, drill out stacks of boards at one time using, these aluminum, uh, using this aluminum die with this brass guide to guide the drill. And then I could you know, do, um, uh, I could mass produce boards. And then I was filling them and uh, I, could, I, I was able to get a production number that was, you know, made it profitable. Uh, and I saw these cool side projects because when I was in Brooklyn, Williamsburg in 2000, 2001, 2002, it was a really awesome place. Um, all of my neighbors, we, we were all poor, we were all working class. There are artists and sculptures and musicians everywhere. Um, this was one of the cool contracts I got from, um, this is one of Jimi Hendrix's Univives. And it came to me broken and I did a restoration on it. Um, had all this custom work done inside. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was just one of those things where, you know, who would think that you would get an opportunity to do that? I repaired it, I, got it, I restored it, got it working. And if you want to know if I played it, I don't think I have to really fill in that blank. Of course I do. Um, and a lot of bands uh, started uh, getting uh, interest in us. This is the Hives. This is uh, when they played Irving Plaza back, I guess, 2004. But the first show that the Hives played in the United States was 2002. They played the Bowery Ballroom. And they were coming to the United States on two hit records. And they'd never played in this country before. So it was like the Beatles when they announced that they were going to play this show at, um, at the Bowery Ballroom. And two weeks before they were due to come into town, we get an email from the Hives saying, we love Franto. And so we got just the, the carte blanche, uh, quite literally. I mean, we, we went, you know, we went in there, they, they bought a bunch of pedals, we hung out with them all day, they did the show. And, it, and the, 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 show, the first high show at the Bowery Ballroom, it was the closest thing to a riot that I've ever been to. I mean, I've been to a lot of punk shows, you know. I went Coney Island High, um, these punk rock venues in New York that, are, that were shut down because of, you know, just they were so crazy. I mean, I've been to a lot of crazy stuff, but I've never been to a show as raucous as that Hive show. They were throwing beer bottles off of the balcony. Paleonquist was insulting the audience at every mic break. It was just totally out of hand. It was beautiful. But there were so many experiences like that. Um, you know, I, uh, Jill Sobule was my neighbor, and so we hung out all the time, and she would always come over to the shop. She lived uh, across the street. And uh, we're still good friends, me and Jill. Uh, Kit Malone. Uh, he went on to do TV on the radio. He, he was actually an employee. He, he helped, uh, helped, helped me out when I was doing Peach Fuzzes. And there are actually Peach Fuzzes out there that are partially built by Kit Malone. Uh, I know people would love to know what those numbers are, but I'm not going to tell. Uh, and Mary Kate O'Neill, she's a singer-songwriter. And this is one of the things I, 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 I kept uh, doing other things, like photography. This is a photograph um, I took of Mary Kate for a Rolling Stone, for uh, an article they did on her. And, uh, and this is a photo I took of my friend Josephine Wakes from the Breeders for uh, Rocker Girl magazine. So I was still getting published uh, with photography. Ah, okay. Here comes the bad news. Adversity. Shit's got to hit the fan someday. <clears throat> well, I, there had always been adversity with with my career and life path. There had always been snags. But um, 2003, you know, I had this really working company. We were making good money, had a factory that was producing good pedals. 2003 was my highest grossing year. And then the Brooklyn waterfront rezoning went through and we were on 10th and Wythe, like right on the river. And and I guess October, November 2003, that whole area got rezoned from commercial to residential. And within weeks, everybody who worked and lived there got kicked out. And so I had a paid two-year lease for two more years, and it was paid. And I got kicked out and locked out of my building. And then my landlord was extorting me for money to, get, to allow access to get my stuff out. It was, it was typical New York stuff. 
So all the money that I spent um, building in that factory was all lost, and I, I, I hadn't I hadn't been profitable long enough to recoup my um, my my investment. So so now <clears throat> I got to make product uh, without a factory, and I got to find a new factory. I got to build it. So I end up uh, going to Bushwick in another raw space that was even rawer, and it was rawer because not only did I have to build in this, but I had to put in a floor and a ceiling too. So, I mean, it was as raw as you could get. I had to put in the plumbing, the uh, electric, um, heating, the cooling, ceiling floor. Uh, it, was, it was an eight-month eight month build-in until I had uh, an, a, a room working where I could work. And it uh, cost a lot of money and cost a lot of time. So, there you go. There we go. New, brand new factory in Bushwick. So I've been pushed out from Williamsburg to Bushwick, and you know, within a year, Williamsburg is officially gentrified, and Bushwick starts getting gentrified. I move into this building, uh, get 1,500 square feet, and when I move into the building, there are 16 people living in the building. By 2007, there are over 60 people living in the building. So I, um, I decided to leave the ever encroaching overwhelming gentrification of Bushwick. And I moved back to PA. And then I, I there, there were some other dramas, uh, personal losses and such, uh, which are sort of already on the record, but basically I, um, as kind of therapy to myself, I started doing a YouTube channel uh, where I just started doing instructional videos and just things I wanted to do. Uh, and um, inadvertently ended up inventing this uh, new kind of career path that I call technological archaeology, which is basically reverse engineering technology because I, I realized that there were materials technologies and electronics and, and mechanics that had been done in, sometimes in the very recent past and the, the, how these things were made and what was in them and how they functioned was completely forgotten about. And there were no records. Uh, these are just, these are like, um, it's like evolution. These are, these are dead ends where um, technologies were built up, perfected, utilized, became ubiquitous, and then they just died off. And when they die off after five, ten years, they're completely forgotten about. No one even, you know, all the records of them are even destroyed. So um, I had done a video because I, um, I have one of these uh, LVDC page assembly boards. This is, this is the second one that I got from a fan. But this is a board that came out of the Saturn V moon rocket. It's part of the computer that actually flew the rocket. A lot of people don't realize it, but the, the Saturn V was the most complex, fully autonomous system ever invented up, till the point, up to that point, in the mid-60s. Um, the rocket was completely automated. There was no human control. Uh, the astronauts who flew on Apollo, they were at the mercy of the computers. And the only human option you had uh, was the option to abort, was an abort handle. And that was it. You pulled the abort handle, it just uh, separated the top part of the rocket, flew away, and that was it. That was the only control you had. All of the flight characteristics, the gimbling, the throttling, everything was done automatically by uh, the, uh, the computer. So from ground to orbit was all the computer. And so this IBM computer that flew the rocket, um, there was absolutely no documentation about it on, a, on hardware level. There were systems, um, diagrams and stuff that you could download, but there was nothing known about the component level um, technology of this computer. And I happened to own one of these boards, so I didn't want to take it apart. But uh, um, a viewer sent in this board that was uh, in a salvage yard and said, take this one apart. So I did. And um, it got me in Popular Science Magazine. This is from the Popular Science article from, um, from uh, a few years ago. Um, and the LVDC project, um, which you can read about, it's on my blog. But it, uh, it spurned uh, a new project, an AGC DISCI project, which brought me to this. This is me at uh, Garber, uh, the Garber facility at the National Air and Space Museum. I'm, I'm measuring a, uh, an Apollo DISCI display. That's, it's part of the, um, the interface for the um, Apollo guidance computer that the astronauts use to control the command module and the lunar module uh, for um, all the Apollo missions. And, um, and I, my project was to reverse engineer the display and make a, make a reproduction of it. So here I am with Carl Barbro. We'd, we've just disassembled a Block 1 disky there. It's all discombobulated. And we did put it back together. It's, it, it, does, it's, it looks worse than it really was. 
Um, but that was uh, also on my blog. I blogged about that. So, and this is another reverse uh, you know, technological archaeology project. The Mailer Day Automaton at the Franklin Institute, um, which you can go and see any time. Um, there's been an ongoing restoration effort to um, to try and bring the machine back to its original state. It's been going on for over 10 years, but uh, I got into it a couple years ago. And, uh, and there's also postings on my blog about the work I've done on that, but that, that's um, another one of those things. So, And I still work in radio. This is, uh, this is uh, me, me with Josh DeBull at WPRV. I do a couple shows every now and then, still, still like to do the radio, but you know, not for pay. Okay, so, enough of my story. Um, some tips for you in um, entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the core of entrepreneurship is risk taking. Risk taking. It's, it's, it's everything. If you're an entrepreneur, you put everything on the line every day. Taking risks is what it's all about. The realities uh, are many, but basically you have to realize everything's at risk every day. Uh, you can lose everything, and you can do everything right and still fail. You can, you can have the right strategy, the perfect product, you can build it right, you can be good with your money and everything and still fail. I'll get to that in a moment. Personal life, what personal life? <laughs> you, uh, everything suffers. Uh, when you have a business and you're, you work all the time, around the clock, um, everything gets sacrificed for it. Relationships, partnerships, friendships. Um, you will grind through people uh, being an entrepreneur. You will grind through them. You, you are ostensibly and legally married to your work, first and foremost. Everything else is second. Possible business ending events. So if you do everything right still, you can lose your lease. Hey, hello, happened to me more than once, twice. Fire, you know, you can have, a, a, you can do an expensive build into a space on a floor of a building that you've put $100,000 in office space, shop space, everything. You've got everything in there and some Yahoo on the floor below you just starts a fire. They're not around. Burns the whole place up. Your floor falls and you lose everything. Done. Robbery. You can have, uh, you can have a software company and everything's on servers and computers. You've got everything in there and then one day someone finds out you've got 100 computers in your space and they come in, they clear you out, it's over. You don't get any of it back. Sickness and injury. You, you, your business depends on you to be um, at, on your toes every day. You've got to maintain it every day. Uh, if you get sick, you know you, you end up in the hospital for a month or months or weeks. Uh, you come down with something serious. You, you get cancer. It's hard to run a business every day. You have a bike crash, motorcycle crash. You get hit by a bus. You're injured. If you're physically injured and you're out of it, you could lose everything. Everything. Shifts in the market, like you can have a great product that you start, like for example, a guitar effects pedal, that, like when no one's making them, and then based on your own success, you can actually spurn a whole business market that builds up around you where everyone wants to take a chunk, and before you know it, you have so many competitors for a market that you create that you get pushed out altogether. The top of the pyramid can fail when the pyramid gets too big. So. You, you're at the top of the pyramid. You're the most respected, the most well-known. Everyone, when they think of your product, they think of you. But you're not making any money because now there are so many people in the game, so many bricks in that pyramid taking little pieces, that your tiny little capstone isn't big enough to sustain the whole genre that you build. It's just true. So what does it take to be so crazy and stupid to make your own business? Well. Drive and work ethic, number one, number two. Probably the same thing, drive and work ethic. You have to have an endless drive, and you have to have work ethic. I learned work ethic from Mert, that working, working that ridiculous rental job where I was doing hard physical labor 10 hours a day, six days a week, you know, and then flying at night like a crazy person. I learned what work ethic is. It's like you're tired, you're, you're exhausted, you, you don't want to do this, but you do it anyway because it's your job. It's work ethic. It's very important um, in entrepreneurship because no matter how hard the task is, no matter what you're facing in any one day, any one week, these tasks have to be done. They, you have problems that have to be solved. You need funding. You know, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. Funding is everything. 95% um, of all startups are going to fail in the first five years. 
The majority of that, for one reason or another, or to one degree or another, is because they run out of funding. 50% uh, of those businesses are going to fail in the first 6 to 12 months because they run out of money. So funding is everything. If you don't have the means to have the funding, if you can't maintain funding, you aren't going to have a company. Um, vision is another thing. Um, entrepreneurship, the difference between entrepreneurship and a company is vision. You don't have to have vision to run a retail store. But if you're creating a product or a service or something new that no one's ever done before, something that's unique to the world, you have to have vision about how to make that happen and how to deliver to people and how people are going to relate to it. You gotta have determination because you're going to have problems every day. You're going to have big problems some days and you're going to have insurmountable problems often. And you're going to have to find a way, some way, come hell or high water to win the day every day, regardless of what it takes, determination. And dare to fail. It's sort of a contrived notion, people say that a lot, but you have to dare to fail. If you are afraid to fail, you will not do anything with your life. End of story. But if you can fail, and if you can fail big and like embarrassingly big, and find a way to bring yourself off the ground and get back in the game, you have what it takes. Never give up. So, success. Well, there are lots of keys to success. These are the major ones. Diversification. Um, if you start a business with a niche idea, a niche product, some kind of service, something unique that you've come up with, it's a niche thing. That might get you in the door, it might get you in the game, but a niche is not a niche for very long because nothing breeds, uh, the, the, nothing causes the destruction of a niche better than success. As soon as you have any success, people are going to jump in there, they're going to want to have a piece of that action, they're going to get in the game. So pretty much immediately, whatever brought you into the game, you're going to have to diversify. Now over the years, you know, I've done, in addition to doing my main job, I've done other things, photography and um, graphic design and, um, you know, art stuff, music. Uh, I'm always trying to find other things I can do to make some change on the side in addition to. You always have to diversify. And you also have to maintain these skills and acquire skills that aren't related to what you do because you might have to drop shop and do something else, like quick, you know. Rent has to be paid and you're up short. Well, guess what? I'm starting a totally new career today so that in three weeks I'm going to have money to make rent. And now I'm making soda. Or now I'm, I'm making a new kind of handbag and I'm going to have it on the market in two weeks. This is what you do. You know, you have to diversify. And I've done all kinds of things. Money management. You've got to be good with money. If you can't stretch the dollar, if you can't manage money, you're not going to get very far in a business. It's just the bottom line. Uh, time management. These go hand in hand. Time is money. You have to know how to allocate your time to solve problems that have to be solved and prioritize things that you have to do to stay on the schedule. You can't get lost in problems. You can't, uh, you can't, over, you can't put off things that have to be done. You really have to have time management to make sure that you get everything done that has to be done when it has to be done. Know your customer. It's kind of a yes, so what, but every business has a customer. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you're making a thing, selling a service, whatever. A business is you do something, you have customers that give you money. And the better you know the customer, the more successful you're going to be. And um, I always say, well, <clears throat> so I, I come from an era when in the 80s companies did market research. You know, they would get a bunch of people, put them in a room, give them questionnaires, ask them all kinds of questions. They'd take all this data and they'd go and they'd make a product or a business based on everything they said. And I found in the effects business that if you ask people what they want, you know, it's like, oh, I make these. Oh, yeah, you know, what I really want is this. I want a thing that does this. Okay, I'll write that out. I really want a thing like, if I had a thing that did this, and I found that if you took a bunch of people and you find exactly what they were looking for, They'll tell you exactly what they want. And you go and you build that. None of them will buy it. Because they don't know what they want. Um, when I came up with the cream puff in 2002, <clears throat> uh, I came up with the idea for the pedal. And, and, I, and because I, was, I had vertically integrated manufacturing, I was doing everything in-house, I went from the first thought of, I'm going to make the pedal that's like this, to having the first pedal for sale in three weeks. And there was absolutely nobody in the business that could do that by a factor of like six to nine months. 
And so I came up with the cream puff. I thought this was great. It's being reissued next month, just letting you know. And so um, I, I went to my dealers and I said, I have this pedal. And all the dealers flat out said, there's no way that we're ever going to sell a pink pedal. It was my biggest selling pedal that year. So, they, you know, your customer doesn't even know what they want. You have to know your customer better than they know themselves. And you do that by being the customer. Sell to yourself. You be the customer. You say, I want this. If, I ha if this existed, I would buy that. And you sell to yourself. And if you sell to yourself, then you can sell to other people. Know your shite. Put expletive there for stuff, whatever you want to put in. Know your shite. You've got to know your stuff. Um, Inside now, uh, you got to be, you got to be on top of your game, and I'll get to that in a moment. Get tough, keep your cool. This is important. I was just trying to exercise that this morning, Michael, about getting stuck, <laughs> stuck behind, between two trucks and not able actually to come here. Trying to keep my cool. Get tough and keep your cool. You got to get tough if you want to be in business for yourself, because you are going to face every kind of conceivable adversity. People are going to come after you. You're going to have people suing you. You're going to have legal problems. You're going to have problems with landlords. You're going to have problems with neighbors. People are going to want to take a piece out of you because of what you're doing. If you have any kind of success, people are going to be all over you. You're going to have to really deal with pressure and adversity. And you've got to keep your cool because if you come unglued under pressure, you are not going to get anywhere in a business. Because every day, there is a disaster. Every morning you get up, there's a disaster waiting for you. And you're going to have to deal with it, keep your cool, work the problem, and think through it. OK, this is the last thing, just for you, um, if you're interested. This is my basic philosophy of business structure I told you about, Michael. This is my, this is my wagon wheel of entrepreneurship. Hello. Yes. Okay. So this is how it starts. If you end up deciding that you want to make a business out of an idea, a product. It's a product. A product can be anything. It can be a thing. It can be an idea. Yeah. It can be a record album. It can be a, a piece of software, you know. It can be a concept, whatever. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. But whatever the product is that you're going to make a business around, the business structure is universal. It begins with the idea of an invention. You come up with something. You have a vision for something. And this is how it starts. But you're going to have to develop a very complex structure to make a business out of this. And this is how it works. First, funding. No money, no business. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter how good the idea is. You need to have funds. And um, in the crowdsourcing world, because everyone's doing crowdsourcing now, myself included, um, the biggest pratfall is the funding. You can get a ton of funding and be out of money in a couple of months and have nothing to show for it. You, you really have to have a sense of money, not only startup costs, but production costs. Follow through. You have to know what the costs are. You have to be good with bookkeeping. Good old-fashioned bookkeeping on paper. Forget about your phone. You don't want to use your phone. If you do your bookkeeping on your phone, you're a fool. You're going to lose the phone. You're going to lose your business. Um, keep books. And you have to learn how to do the cash accounting method. Keep, you know, know, track every single dime that comes in and goes out of your company. You want to know where your losses are. You want to know where you're efficient. You want to know where you have to cut costs. All this stuff. These are skills. And you have to deal with the tax man, especially in Philadelphia. because We have the second highest tax rate in the country. Believe you me, that city hall, they want their dollars. You have to keep track of your inventory and supplies. And this is actually a full-time job in itself. It doesn't matter what you're making. You're going to need supplies, everything from toilet paper to circuit boards and you know, office supplies, everything. Every little thing that you're going to need to, to run a business, and there's lots of little details, you've got to keep track of all of them. And you have to project into the future, when am I going to be out of this? And so I'm not going to be shut down for two weeks waiting for some stupid little thing. It's a job in itself. All right, sales and marketing. Uh, a lot of people see this as being like, you know, the second half of entrepreneurship. That's, that entrepreneurship is just two things. It's just you have a product and you sell it. Well, yeah, it's, but it's, it's only like a small portion of it. But sales is an art form. You know, selling is an art form. And marketing is an art form. The whole thing about sales is something I call the handshake. And it's this. You have a product, a service, whatever it is. There's billions of people in the world. The world is full of people who want your product. 
want your service. They, they want what you have. You have people out there who, who, will, who are willing to buy right now what you're doing, what you're selling. The art is trying to find a way to get all the, out of the entire population of the globe, to get those people who want your product, to bring them to the point where you can get them close enough where you can put it in their hand. And that's the handshake. You're putting the product in their hand. That is a very difficult thing to do. Um, design the second style. You, there's functionality, right? But this is a thing that a lot of people overlook. Design, aesthetic, style. You have to have an aesthetic to something. It's overlooked so much today. Um, there are so many technology companies that will make a, a, a a little board that does a really great thing. They'll put it on a little board, you get it on a perf board, and then it's, you, know, you get a board with some things you can solder to something, and it'll do something great. Fine, but put it in a really cool case, an ergonomic case, put it in an attractive thing, and inter interface it in a human way, and you've got something really cool. And that is a product. It's the difference between a product and just selling a widget, a stack and style, and that is a whole other job in itself. Engineering and production, you know, you want, it to, you want your product to be engineered well. You want it to work well. You want it to be efficient. You want to get the bugs out of it. You want it to interface well with the user. You want it to not break. Um, engineering, it's, it's a whole other skill set. And production, that's, you're going to have to come up with all, if you, if you do it in-house, which will save you money uh, and eliminate problems, you're going to have to come up with all kinds of tools, methods, uh, procedures to get the thing put together on a budget, you know, put it, get it put together on time and on budget. It's an art form, it's a science, so many disciplines in production, and I should know I've been doing it a long time. And lastly, public relations, social, social network, and press and media, okay, everybody's on Twitter, everyone's got a Facebook page, so what? Well, the problem is everyone's on Twitter, everyone's got a Facebook page, so you can be out there, but who's looking at you? You know. Being in the press, being in the media, having public relations is more than just being visible. You, you have to be seen, and that's a completely different thing. But here's the thing. You have, in order for a business to work, you have to have proficiency in all of these areas. You, know, you have to have equally strong skills and, um, and, and abilities in all of these areas for it to work. If, you, if you're strong in sales, but you don't really know anything about engineering, you're going to have a hard time with the business. If you're not particularly good with money, if you just say, eh, you know, I have an accountant, you know, I give them a stack of papers, well, good luck. Um, you really have to be on top of every single facet. Even if you farm out and have people work for you, you have to know all their jobs as well as they, as, as they know them. You can't depend on other people to do the heavy lifting for you. You have to be as good at every job, of every employee you have, as they are for it to work. That is the principle of um, entrepreneurship. So, good luck. And thank you. <laughs>